tells us uh, the man who had been possessed of this, this unclean spirit was, who was now saved. He wanted to go home. He wanted, Jesus asked him to go home, go tell your friends, go tell what God has done, what great things that God has done. And we saw that even in life's most difficult situations and circumstances, that where doctors have no answers, where people in life just don't have answers, God always does. Why? Because he's God. Because that no matter what happens, that he is truly the only one that we can turn to and trust in all of our life situations. We may think, well, you know, I don't really need to ask the Lord about, you know, whether or not I should buy a house or buy a car or those kind of situations or whether or not, you know, I should just go listen to the doctors even when they have no answers. But God wants, you know, to be a part of every situation in your life, not just the ones that you deem as being important. All right, because to God, He wants you uh, you to do that as well. And so this morning, if you have a Bible, Mark chapter six is where we're going to start reading. So Tim, if you would play that for us. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him? that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could do there no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages, teaching. And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into an house, there abide, till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet, for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils, and anointed with oil many that were sick, and healed them. And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John knowing that he was a just man and an holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things, and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced, and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask me whatsoever thou wilt and I will give it thee. And he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king, and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry, Yet for his oath's sake, and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner, and commanded his head to be brought. 
And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and outwent them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away, that they may go into the country round about, and into the villages, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread, and give them to eat? He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five, and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they, said, uh, and they sat down in ranks by hundreds and, and by fifties. And when he had taken the uh, five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up uh, to heaven and blessed and uh, break the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two uh, fishes uh, divided he among them all. And, uh, and they did all eat and were filled. And uh, they took up the 12 baskets uh, full of fragments of the fishes, and they did eat of the loaves uh, were about 5,000 men. And straightway he, he constrained his disciples to get into uh, the ships and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when, he, uh, when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw uh, them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh uh, unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have uh, passed them by. But when uh, they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And he went uh, up unto, the, unto them into the ship. And the, the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves. For, they, uh, for their heart was hardened. And when they had passed over, they came into the land of Gazaret. And, and drew to the shore. And when they were come out of the ship, straightway they knew him and ran, a through, uh, ran through that whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick when they, uh, when they heard he was. And whithersoever he entered into uh, villages or cities or country, they, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch if it were but the border of his garment, and as many as touched him were made whole. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that your word is truth, that it is just uh, as applicable to our lives today as it was, uh, or as it always has been. And Lord, we ask that this morning that you would give us ears to hear, God, that your word would fall upon the fertile soil, Lord, and that it would bring, a full, uh, bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's look back at Mark, uh, you know, at, at the beginning of Mark uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. It says this, it says, And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the, uh, the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence 
hath this man uh, these things? And uh, what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is, this, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of uh, Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and his own, uh, his own kin, and in his own house. And could, there, and could there do no mighty work, save that he uh, laid hands upon a few sick folk and healed them? And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. Now, when we first read that part, it says that they were astonished. And so often, you know, times when we say a person is astonished, we think that they're amazed, that, they're, that they have this, like, awe about what just happened, that they didn't, you know, that they were excited, but they were like, oh, my goodness, I cannot believe that that's such a profound thing that has happened. But what we actually see here is the fact that they were offended by his teaching. Why? Because he was preaching hard. Oftentimes, people don't like it when uh, pastors preach hard or Christians in, in general start talking against what they're doing. They don't like it because of the fact that it goes contrary to what they like and they believe in the way that uh, their life is. They don't want their way of life to change. They're like, you know what, pastor, you're fine as long as you don't touch, you know, my little, uh, my little you know, a hobby that I have. And so what we see in here is the fact that they were offended at his teaching. This is something we don't necessarily see in the modern church nowadays because everybody says that Jesus says that he loves everybody. And that everybody loved Jesus. But we could see this in here that they, not everybody loved Jesus. That there were people that were offended by what he, he preached. I, I've said it, you know, I, I've said it before, we'll say it again, is the fact that if you preach the gospel to people, if you're preaching what the Bible says, people will get offended. They don't, you don't have to add to it to make you know, people offended at you. You preach the, what God's word says, they will be offended. We're like, I don't want to preach the gospel if it's going to do that. No, you need to. Because, you know, I, I believe that every single person in this room you know, that we have is saved. And the thing is, is that how did you get here? Somebody possibly offended you to get you saved. Because just because it offends you does not mean it's wrong. That's what you know, the modern-day liberals need to realize. Just because something offends you does not mean it's wrong. Just because something you know, goes against the way you're living does not mean it's wrong. We have far too many people out there nowadays, oh, you hurt my feelings, so it's wrong. No, you know what? Feelings you know, get hurt. Feelings change. Emotions change. And what needs to happen is that people need to realize that that's what happens. And that when Jesus is speaking, that it's, it's truth. And if he says it, it's true. And we need to say, you know what? I'm offended, but you know what? I need to change that. I need me to change, not God's word to change. And here's an interesting verse. In verse 3, it says, you know, it brings out the fact, by the way, that Jesus had siblings. And you say, well, why is that important? Well, we've been talking about it on Wednesday nights. We, we were talking about the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church believes that Mary was a perpetual virgin, meaning that she was a virgin in her entire life, and that she is now holy, and that she's now a part of the Trinity, and a part of the Immaculate Conception, and that the only person that she ever gave birth to was Jesus, and that was that she is without sin, all these things. And they say that she has no children. And here's the thing. If you ever meet a, you know, if you ever talk to a Catholic and they, you talk about this area about Mary, just know that in their Bible, this, is, this verse is in there. I looked it up. That this verse is in there where it talks about the fact that it says, is this not, you know, the carpenter, the, uh, the son of Mary, the brother, the brother of James? You can't, let me see. You can't have a brother if they're not related to you. And by the way, uh, he is speaking wrong in this. They looked at it as his brother, but which, in fact, they're actually Jesus' stepbrothers and stepsisters. All right? Different dad, right? So you have James, Joseph, and Judah, and Simon says, and are not his sisters here with us? So he not only has uh, you know, brothers, he also has sisters. Does not sound like Mary was a perpetual virgin to me. Does not sound like she was, with, quote, unquote, without sin because, you know, and they say that, you know, because, uh, you know, she didn't have sin because she didn't, you know, she was a virgin for the rest of her life. Well, I'm here to tell you also, she got married to Joseph. And from this, it looks like Joseph and her had some children. Because the Catholic Church also comes along the lines that they believe that if a married couple is together and they do marital things, that somehow that's sin. 
And I was like, how is it sin when God created it? And how is it sin when it's done within the confines of the marriage bed? And so there's a lot of things. I'm not going to start preaching about the Catholic Church, but there's a lot of things that just in this one verse you go, gee, the Catholic Church kind of folds just in that one verse. And so, like I say, you can go to their Bible, whichever edition that they have or whatever, you can look up Mark 6, 3, and it will say it exactly how this says it. So I don't know how they get around that. Oh, yes, they do. I do know how. The Pope says that she was a virgin, so that means that it is, we go against God's word. It's kind of the same way as long as the, uh, as the Muslims. They will believe a lot of the New Testament, a lot of the uh, Bible in general, but they'll say when, it, when the Bible contradicts what, or the, what the Bible says and then goes against the Quran, they'll say, well, the Bible's corrupted in that area. You ever notice in these false religions that there's always you know, this way, this little loophole they say, well, Muslims say, well, the Bible's corrupted in that area, that's why you needed to read the Quran. The Catholics say, well, no, the Pope changed that, and we believe what the Pope says instead of what the Bible says. Read the Bible for yourself. By the way, the Catholic Church has a false Bible. It, it's a false Bible. Besides the fact of them having extra books in there, it's a false translation. You say, well, Pastor, that sounds really, really mean. You know what? You see, Jesus preached hard, and they were offended. Sometimes, you know what? I might have to preach hard. The funny thing and the ironic thing is that usually, you know, when I, uh, when I preach harder than what I normally do, or because of the, you know, the subject matter, I get, usually get people coming and saying, you know what, that was a great sermon. So maybe I need to get a little wired up this morning. Yeah. Amen. Verses 5 and 6, it says, this, it says that Jesus could only heal a few people. Why? Unbelief. The people weren't saved. If the people aren't saved, they're not going to believe that Jesus can heal. Plain and simple. I mean, there's oftentimes you may have a person come along and they'll say, oh, you know, please pray for me. And they'll accept it and whatever, but they don't believe it. They just, you know, it's like going on like Facebook or Twitter or any of those other ones. I haven't been on there in a long time, but I remember people saying, I'm sending good thoughts your way. I'm sending good vibes. Well, unless you're, be- uh, you know, unless you're like a beach boy, good vibrations ain't going to get you anywhere. And, you know, or pray, uh, praying, you know, just to pray and you're, and you're not saved is not going to help either. Because the Bible even says that he does not hear the prayer of the wicked, but he does hear the prayer of the upright. And who are the upright? The saved, the believers. So you know what? Don't sit there and send out your good vibes, your good thoughts, or your prayers to a wicked false god. You know what? Get saved, and then you know what? Then I'll accept your prayers. Oh, wait, that's a little harsh, Pastor. I'm just preaching what God's word said. He could not and he would not, for we need uh, to have faith if we are going to receive the works of God. We have to have faith. We have to believe that who he is, right? That he is and that he can for those who what? Diligently seek him. People will also hate those who lead God's people. You say, well, Pastor, are you saying that people hate you? Oh, yeah, I know there are people that hate me. I know it. But if you, are, if you are leading by example as being a, a believer in Christ, say you're a deacon. Say you're not a deacon. Say you're just a person that lives your life committed to Christ. They will hate you. Why? Because of who you represent. Because you're actually going out and you're actually living the way you're supposed to live of how God wants you to live. Are you perfect? No. And that's what they'll say. They're like, well, do you think you're perfect or something? But like, no, I'm not perfect. You want to go with the old, you know, the old saying? I'm not perfect. I'm just forgiven. But here's the thing, is that when we see this, that people will hate you because of who you are and who you follow, do we see Jesus stop preaching? Do we see Jesus go, oh man, they don't like me anymore. They don't like the fact that I'm not just telling them to just love one another and that's it. They're not telling them, you know, you know he's actually just not going around saying judge not and they're not really actually understanding when he says judge not lest you be judged because the Bible actually says there's a reason for you not to judge. But the Bible also says there's a reason for you to judge. But here's the part is, is that if you look at the latter part of verse 6, what does it say? It says, and he went around about the villages doing what? Teaching. 
He didn't stop teaching. He didn't stop preaching. He did not you know, stop telling people uh, God's uh, word, uh, good word. And so we shouldn't either. If so, somebody comes up to us and says, you know what, I don't like what you have to say. Hopefully it encourages you to keep on preaching, to keep on doing it. Keep on you know, telling people about Jesus. I, I, you know, I, I think I told you a story a while back you know, when I was... Um, when I would, you know, work and I was getting ready, to, you know, I was like in Bible college and kind of doing those things. I would come back to, you know, for summer and I would work. I would have people come up to me and tell me to be quiet about Jesus, or say I don't like that. I don't like this. At first, you know, when it first happened, I was kind of like, oh, am I doing something wrong? But then I looked at, you know, we began to read the Book of Acts, and every single time that that happened to someone for that, you know, for somebody trying to shut them up for you know, preaching God's word, what did they do? They got more excited about it. So I said, you know what, Lord, I got, obviously got to change. So I just started doing it. And the thing is, is that I got more excited about preaching it. I figured, you know what, if somebody gets offended, I must be doing something right. I didn't go around just trying to offend people. I just told them what God's word was. And then if they got offended, I'm going, must be good. I must be getting at, you know, maybe their little, their little thing, that they, their little hobby that they want to keep at. Let's look at verses 7 through 13. It says this. It says, and he called unto the uh, unto him the twelve, and began to send them out. To, uh, began to send forth two by two, and gave them power over clean, over unclean spirits, and commanded uh, them that they should take nothing for their journey, save or except a staff only, no script. That means like no bag to put your stuff in, no bread, no money, you know, in their purse, which would be like a wallet. But be shod with sandals, and not a uh, and not put on two coats. And he said unto him, In what place soever uh, ye enter into a house, there abide until ye depart from that place. And, uh, and whosoever shall not receive you or hear you, when, uh, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it, w- uh, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah and the day of judgment than for, uh, for that city. And they went out and they preached that men should repent or turn to God. And they cast out uh, many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. And so what we see in here for one thing is how to go door to door. He shows us how to go to door to door, how to, how to go soul winning, how to go door to door. Mind you, today at 3 o'clock we're going to go back out soul winning again. Last week we didn't do it because of the weather, but we're going to go back out. Already had two people saved this year, so that's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. So if you want to join us. Meet us here at 3, and we'll go out. And so when we see this, you know, like I say, he sends them out two by two. It's always a good idea if you're going to go out and you're going to go knock door to door to have another person with you. Do you know why? It's always a good idea to have somebody with you, for one thing, that's you know, going to be praying with you as you're talking to people, but also to have somebody in case somebody says something that you didn't do. Nowadays, you know, that seems to be the way, because oftentimes we've been out, you know, uh, like when we've been out, you know, doing it, we'll have people like invite us into our house. And so oftentimes that's a very nice thing, they'll stay coming into our house. But what makes a person, you know, sit there and say that they're not going to, you know, say something or try something or do it? So if you have somebody else with you, you can go ahead and have them with you. But notice here also, Jesus has other disciples, right? He has other followers. It's not just the 12, correct? But who does he give power to? He gives power to the twelve, to the apostles. He gives power to them. What's an apostle? An apostle is just a, a follower of Jesus Christ, but he's also the original twelve. Why do you say? Because there's people out there nowadays that will say an apostle, you know, that they are an apostle. It's impossible. It's an impossible for a person nowadays to be an apostle. You say, well, no, I, I met so-and-so. They, they, their title is apostle. I don't care what their title is. The one, uh, you know, there's a couple. There's a couple of requirements to be an apostle. The main one is is that you had to see Jesus while he was alive, and I can guarantee nobody, you know, nobody in this town or in this country or in this world is two thousand years old. I mean, our president may think that he's one hundred and eighty years old, but he's not even close to, or he's been serving in office for that long. But the thing is, is that that's one of the main things. And that's the, but apostle is a follower of Jesus, one of the original twelve, and so he sends out the twelve. He doesn't send out any other believers. He just sends out the 12 with that power to be able to uh, cast out unclean spirits, uh, unclean spirits and nothing else. He says, take nothing but the essentials. He says, take nothing but the essentials. He says, take a staff. 
You know why he would tell, tell him to take a staff? It's possibly for defense, a defensive kind of weapon, because if you have a staff, if you have, you know, the past couple, uh, past couple weeks and stuff like that, past month or so, uh, we've been down over there on Zeta. And uh, there's a dogs that, you know, run down that neighborhood. And they're like, oh, they're all nice. I don't know that when a dog comes running at me going, Arr! you know. But you might want to have some sort of defense, you know, when that comes about. Good thing was that people would come out of the house and say, oh, you, you know, King, get out of here, and that, that dog and this dog and everything else. But it, it's, it's possibly, you know, it could be used for a defensive weapon. It also could be just for walking, as a, like a walking stick. It could also be, you know, you know, for you, if it's too hot outside or whatever, you want to place your coat on it. Instead of, like, holding it in your arm, you could just put it over the back of it, and you're carrying that thing along as you're going, or put it on top of your staff as you're walking. And it also could be, um, you know, I found this interesting. It could be because uh, at this time it was okay. You might, today you, you probably have to ask someone to do this, but to knock fruit off of a tree. So that way if you get hungry, knock it off the tree and eat. You want to ask somebody nowadays because you don't want to go over to the house and start taking, you know, stuff off their tree. But back then it was okay for, uh, for them to do that. And it says, you know what, one coat. says, you know, you don't want to get too hot. And then also uh, you need sandals or shoes. You don't want to go out barefoot. These are very practical things that he's, he's telling them to do. Scripps is the bag that used to be able to help, hold bread. That's why he's saying, you know what, take that staff with you. You can knock down some fruit or whatever from a tree and be able to eat. But he's saying, you know what, you don't even need to take bread with you. He says, don't bring any money. If we truly believe God's going to provide, he's going to provide, right? And also, all these things that he's telling them to not bring, it's one less thing for them to worry about. Because if they don't have their wallet, if they don't have, uh, they don't have you know, these bags or anything else, Nobody can come up to them and try and rob them for anything. What are they going to do, rob them for the stick? I mean, that's about it. And so when we go out, we, go out, we, take, some, you know, we take some tracks with them just in case somebody says, I don't have time for the moment. We say, okay, well, you, you know, can I give you something to read? And they say, well, sure. And then you just go ahead and you hand it to them with all of our information from the church on it. And oftentimes where the fact that somebody says, well, no, I don't, you know, like not having time or they're getting ready to leave, all those kind of things and situations. I have had situations where I said, can I leave you with something? And the person's like, no. That was also preceded by the fact of me saying, hey, can I share something with you today about how to get to heaven, you know, and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're going there? No. You would think, you would say, well, why wouldn't a person want to hear that? I don't know. But they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to. But it's always what he's telling you uh, in this way. When you go out, when you're doing these things, he wants you to be prepared. He says, uh, whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, when uh, ye depart thence, uh, shake, off the, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. John Gill put it this way. They had, uh, they had been with them and attempted to preach the gospel to them, but they despised and rejected it. Wherefore, they departed from them as an unworthy people against whom the dust of their feet would rise as a testimony against them in the day of judgment. The Bible even talks about that when they shake the dust off their feet, it's going to be a testimony against them in the day of judgment. He actually even goes so far in the fact that he says, you know, it would have been far better. Uh, you know what? Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be far better than you on the day of judgment. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Fire and brimstone, right? Fell from heaven. Because of, you know, doing, you know, being sodomites and everything else. He says it's going to be far better for them. And he destroyed them with fire and brimstone. He says it's going to be far better for them on the day of judgment. You know, for that. So, just so you know, it says, uh, you know, for when you go out and those will reject the gospel, you know what? It just says, you know what? That we are to dust, you know, shoot the dust off our feet and keep on going. If they don't want to hear it, they don't want to hear it. We're not going to sit there and force it down their throats. You can't sit there and make somebody listen to the gospel. You can't make somebody get saved. Your job is to bring the seed and preach God's word to them. And so, the, you know, the 12 continue to preach and teach and go uh, about those things. And we see, you know, in there is that um, in this next part, all of a sudden it kind of ch uh, changes and transitions because all of a sudden we go about what Jesus is doing to what is happening to John the Baptist. John the Baptist, uh, we see in here, is his death, in Her you know, his death in Herod's nightmare. He thinks that John the Baptist came back to life. He had John the Baptist, uh, you know, beheaded because why? His daughter that he had with his brother's wife that he married. And people think that, like, you know, Jerry Springer is all new. No, this has been happening for years. All right? 
she does not like what John the Baptist has to say. And so what we, you know, we see in here is that we're going to read about John the Baptist's death first and then hear about how it all, you know, all happened. That basically she comes in, she's got his head on a giant platter, and, she, and the daughter's going, here, Mom, I got you a present. I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to, you know, like my wife or somebody come in here and say, hey, I have a severed head for a present for you. Please don't do that to me. Okay. But it was a present. Why? Because she didn't like, Mom didn't like what John the Baptist was saying about her. She said, oh, you're saying that about me. No, what John the Baptist was doing, uh, was doing there, he was preaching God's word. He was telling her, you know what, that's against God's word and you should not be doing it. And so, like I say, uh, Herod believes that it's, you know, that John the Baptist had raised from the dead and, you know, he hears all the things that Jesus is doing. So Jesus is getting, a, you know, is getting called John the Baptist because they're like, oh, well, he raised from the dead because of all the stuff that he's doing. And so people will love the truth when it's okay with how they are living. Or when the preacher or a believer, I'm going to use it interchangeably here because you know what? It said, blessed are those who preach the gospel, you know, who speak. It does not talk about a pastor. It's talking about a preacher, and a preacher is who? Somebody who loves Jesus. It's a believer. All right? When, it, uh, when the preacher or the believer um, is preaching something that's near and dear to them, and they don't want to get rid of it, people will hate this. They'll hate the truth, and especially the messenger when the, uh, the preacher condemns what they are doing because it goes against the Bible. So you say, well, where is this in the Bible? Where is John, John the Baptist getting this from? He's getting it from Leviticus. Leviticus is a great book to read. You say, well, no, it's just a whole bunch of these things. No, a lot of our moral standards that we've had or still have in the United States comes from the book of Leviticus. So all the laws that we have, all the things that the police follow, comes from Leviticus. All right, Leviticus 18, verses uh, six and, uh, 16 says this, None of you shall uh, approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. He is saying, don't do it. Hebrews 13.4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. Both whoremongers and idolaters, God will judge. So what is he saying? He's saying basically, this is what happens when you go about things that you're not doing right. Because a marriage bed is to be undefiled. It is to be, on, uh, it is to be honored above all things. And just so you know, when you speak God's truth, you will suffer persecution. You will suffer and be persecuted as well. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Is there any, you know, is there any part of that that I need to exegete? Any part of that of going, I need to explain that further. That's what I mean. It says that if you want to live godly in Christ Jesus, what? You are going to suffer persecution. And so he said, if you're sitting there going, you know what, I haven't really suffered all that much persecution. Is the Bible wrong? Or are you wrong? And maybe the way, you're not, you know, the way you're not living your life as believers. Because if you're not suffering persecution, the Bible says that you're going to suffer persecution. So that means that you're wrong, right? I, I got some other going, I want to be wrong. You just do what God, you know, just go out there and preach God's word. It's going to happen to you naturally. So next what we see in here is the work of ministry. And self-care. What I wanted to actually, you know, the title of my sermon, and I didn't say this earlier, is a day in the life of ministry. We're seeing so far a day in the life of ministry. Of what, you know, how things, you know, kind of should be for those that are believers. Let's skip down to, to verse 30. It says, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told, uh, told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come uh, ye yourselves apart, into a desert place and rest a while, for there were, there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by, uh, by ship privately. And the people uh, saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and went, uh, out went them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, 
saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Now, what, I want, what we see here is the, those 12 apostles, those t- uh, all returning, and they're saying, you know what? They're telling Jesus what happened. They said, this is what took place. This is what we're, what, this is what we're preaching. You know, this many people got saved. This many people got healed. This many people, they were going, as they were going door to door. And what does he tell them to do? Out of this whole entire thing, we see all these things happening, right? We see Jesus sends them out and says, you know what? Go preach the gospel. Go door to door and tell them about these things, about what you see God doing. And what does Jesus tell them to do after they came back, after they've given the report, after they've you know, said this, all these people got saved, all these people, you know, all this stuff has happened. What does he tell them to do? Well, look at verse 31. Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and what? Rest a while. This is one of those things that Christians don't like to do, or they think it's wrong when they take a rest. Some say, I always have to be doing about my father's business. You can while you're resting. You know that, right? You can still be doing. God asks us to rest at times, that it is okay to get away from the noisiness and the hurryingness and to take some time to refresh and get some rest. After going out and doing ministry, after you do those things, it's okay to have a day of rest. Now, what ends up happening a lot of times in churches is that you have a a group of people, a small group of people in the church that will do everything in the church. They never get rest. It's getting quieter and quieter now. They will do a lot of the work. They will do pretty much all the work, and they will get burned out. Why? Because they were not able to do what God's word says, and rest a while. So then you have the ones that have been resting for 30 years in the church. They're not doing anything. They're, they've been resting. They're like, oh, I'm just waiting for that time. They've been waiting for a long time. Meanwhile, that group that's been committed to the church, to the body of believers, to the work of the Lord, they get tired, they get weary because they're not able to rest. I'm not saying that it's wrong for a person to take a vacation because if that was the case, for one thing, you know, we could take a vacation every year. Why? To rest. I'll tell, I'm going to tell you a little secret here. When we take a vacation, we enjoy it when we look at our cell phone and we have no reception or it says no service. Not because we don't love you, not because we don't love ministry, but we're there to take a rest. You're like, oh my goodness, Pastor, what are you telling us? You don't like us? You don't want to hear our request? No, there's been times where somebody has texted us and we've seen like something because it's an urgent request. We're not like, oh, sorry, go talk to somebody else. We don't do that. That's stupid. But I'll tell you this, it may take us a little bit longer to get to that message instead of maybe having that phone right next to us. Because you know that, you know, cell phones haven't always existed. I know teenagers, that's a, and those younger than that are, it's, it's a baffling thing. Like, cell phones haven't always existed? They haven't. It's only been probably in the past, what, 15, 20 years that they got really, really popular. I say really popular because I remember the days when my mom had a bag phone. She had a bag phone. My dad was the carrier. Not, not AT&T, not T-Mobile. My dad was the carrier because he, he literally carried that bag around with him all the time. That phone rang. goes, oh, you got a phone call. And she's going around with the phone with the cord still attached because it's a bag phone. Still attached. And my dad's walking around with her as she's going around with the phone, going through aisles at the grocery store. When it costs about a dollar, two dollars a minute. That's the other thing. Unlimited talk and text did not happen until recently. It's a strange thing. I know you're like, what are you talking about? I have unlimited text. I can just talk to whoever I want to all the time. You couldn't before. My parents said, you better make sure it's an emergency when I give you the cell phone because if I get a bill back and it's a whole lot of money, you don't want to know what's going to happen. But it's okay, again, I'm going to go back to this. It's okay to take a rest. When you've been doing ministry, you've been doing work and all these things, it's okay to take a rest. 
Now, sometimes what people do is that when they say, I'm taking a rest, we don't see them all summer, right? Pastor, I need to take a rest. Three months later, that's, a, that's, that's not a rest, that's a hibernation. <laughs> we are to be in God's you know, house so we can grow in the grace and the knowledge of the truth. Right? But it's okay for us to take a rest. And oftentimes people say, oh, I'm going to take a rest. That means also that they're not reading their Bibles, they're not praying. You take a rest. The only person that's truly going to refresh you and give you that rest is Jesus Christ. Go to his word, pray, seek his face, study his word, and get to know. And I guarantee you'll come back more refreshed. We have, um, why am I forgetting his name all of a sudden? The one from Portageville, Jordan Robbins. He came over and told me, he says, you know, uh, he's like, when I go on vacation, he goes, I use that as an opportunity to like kind of catch up. And I said, well, you, what do you mean by catch up? He goes, I go there and I study God's word on vacation. He studies God's word while he's on vacation. People are like, well, I'm on vacation. I'm supposed to be resting. What he's realized and he knows is the fact that your only way you're truly going to get rest is when you're resting in him. Oftentimes people read that scripture in Psalm 46 that says, be still and know that I am God. And they're like, I'm going to do nothing. You need to do something. That's why God's word says to meditate upon his word day and night. Do you know the word meditate does not mean this weird yoga thing? It does not mean uh, emptying your mind. Because some people say, well, when you meditate upon God's, you're supposed to enter your mind of everything. And you're supposed to go into this, this is weird mystics thing that they start doing with you. What it means to meditate is the fact that you are thinking upon God's word, that you're going back to his word, that when you're reading his word, you're contemplating what it says, that you actually know what it says, that you actually say, you know what, God, I want to be more like, like you because I'm reading your word and I'm seeing that your word says something different than what my life is showing. That what it means, that's what it means to meditate upon God's word is that we're actually taking time to actually hear what it says. Not just read it, but hear it. Because the Bible says not to only be a hearer of the word, but to be a what? A doer of the word. We need to follow what God's word says. We need to rest in his presence because he's the one that only truly can bring that rest to us, to our souls. Have you ever noticed that when you've been doing ministry, you get tired than when you do an 18-hour shift? And you could be a construction worker. You will get more tired doing ministry than you will be doing anything else. You say, how is that possible? All you're doing is just walking around talking to people about Jesus. Because there's something else going on. Because when you do your job, you're doing it physically. But when you're doing, you know, uh, going around doing ministry, you're not only doing it physically, but you're also doing it mentally and spiritually. If you're not doing it spiritually, if there's not the fact that you want God's word you know, coming through you as you're doing ministry then you won't be tired. And you'll feel like you accomplished nothing. Why? Because you didn't. When we do ministry, we will get tired. God says, rest a while. Rest a while. We need to get to the spot to where we are free from noise and hurry to take some rest and refreshment. After we've gone, you know, done all the, the hard labors and you got great fatigue and preaching and working miracles, we need to take a rest. Jesus takes a rest, and then what does he do when he sees the crowd coming to him? He has compassion on them and does what, you know, gives them what they need. But if we read the next part of it, What's the whole re reason why we you know, look at the, you know, the fact of them needing rest? It says, they were many, uh, there were many coming and going. People kept coming back and forth, kept on going. Wanting more from the disciples, wanting more from Jesus, wanting more from believers. And it says, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. They didn't even have time to eat. So you can see why they needed to take a rest, right? People will come and go back and forth, wanting you because you might be the only person that will actually give them good advice or they might be the only person that will help them. But there comes a point where you say, you know what, can I talk to you tomorrow? Because if it's a real, I'm not saying if the person's like, I, you know, my mother is in the hospital dying, come to me tomorrow. That's a different situation. 
If they're saying, you know what, can you help me put siding on a house, and you're like, I just got done working, and I've been out ministering and all this other stuff, you could say, you know what, I'll talk to you tomorrow. It's okay. If you need me to sign a, a, sign a note, like a little doctor's note, saying that it's okay to take a rest, I will. I say this because there's a lot of people in here that need to hear that, that it's okay. It says, uh, in verse 30, uh, 32, it says, and they departed into the de- uh, desert place by ship uh, privately. Why? Because they didn't want people to notice. They actually went a remote route because they didn't want people to notice because they wanted to rest. The people kept on coming. And did Jesus tell them to, uh, to go away? When he arrives, it says he was moved with compassion toward them because they were as what? Sheep not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When people are starting to come up to you and saying, what must I do to be saved? That's not a time to take a rest. I don't know how many of you ever had that issue where you've had like, you know, throngs and throngs of people coming up to you and saying, you know, what must I do to be saved? But if that happens and when that happens, that's not the time to take a rest. That's the time you preach the gospel, and then you say, you know what, you need to come to a good Bible-believing church. Bible-believing church. Did you ever notice that most, uh, uh, that most of the time that Jesus is preaching the gospel, it's not with inside the four walls of a church? You say, well, that was a synagogue. You get my point. He goes out to preach the gospel. Am I saying it's wrong for you to invite your friends and family to church? No. I am saying that we need to go out because you know what? A lot of people aren't coming in. Because a lot of them have heard the, you know, the thing over and over again, and they're like, I don't, they, they just don't see a point to it. We need to show them the point of becoming a believer and growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. I'm not going to read the next portion of Scripture. I'm just going to go through it really quick. Uh, verses 35 through 46 talks about Jesus feeding the 5,000, the 5,000 men. He has five loaves and two fishes. And uh, Jesus and the 12 had a busy day there. They had gone door to door, preaching, teaching, miracles. Then he feeds the 5,000. So the day is not over yet. And so what does it say he does next? After this, after all that stuff that, he, that they had done, he had feed the 5,000, does all this stuff. Verse 46 says this. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to what? Pray. When you are resting, you should be praying. After a long day of ministry, you should be, uh, go pray and rest. Jesus and his disciples had ended the day the best way possible. They ended it by getting away from everything, from all the hustle and bustle, from all the noisiness, from all the crowds and everything else. And they said, you know what? We're going to go pray. We're going to go rest. Ministry will take its toll upon a person, both mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Not to mention the time it takes to study. This is what a believer, you know, the Bible says to do, right? As far as ministry. To study, to go door to door, to visit those in the hospital and nursing homes, plus minister to your family. Do you not think that that's going to take time out of your day and that's going to be taxing upon you? You some say, uh, Some say, well, you know, I can't do that all in one day. Can you do it over a week? Spread it out over a week. Go visit somebody that's in a nursing home. Go visit somebody that's, you know, in the hospital. Go, go door to door. Go study. If your time of studying God's word is, is, I got 15 more minutes to go before I have to leave, that's not time of study. All you're doing is basically, you're not even focused on what you're doing. You need to get away from a while, for a while and actually from the, you know, from the hurry, from the whole, uh, the whole point of it. I mean, you know, the, the hurry and the hustle and bustle of everything off your schedule. So that's why oftentimes the Bible says to what? Rise early in the morning while it's still morning. Because you know what? Things haven't started yet. Your schedule hasn't started yet. This is something that I've been trying to, you know, trying to do. Oftentimes, I, you know, I'll be honest, I, you know, I failed at it. But I need to rise up early so that way... You know, not like at noon I'm going, oh, I should read God's word. Oh, wait, no, I got to go do this. Verses 51 and 52 says this. It says, and he went up 
unto, uh, unto them into the ship, and the, and the wind ceased, and they were so amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered, for they had not, for they, yeah, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. In here, he's not saying that they're, you know, that they're like not saved or they lost something or whatever. It just means that they're probably from the fact that they have been doing so much, doing so much ministry, that their mind was dull to perceive it. That they just did not think about it anymore because they had seen so much going on. Their, their mind was basically fried at that moment from all the stuff that they had done. And so they were so amazed in themselves beyond and wonder, because, you know, it says, um, because what ended up happening is that they had looked at it and they were not quickly to learn from the ministry that they had just done. You need to look back at your ministry that you've done throughout the day and begin to perceive what God had done in, in and through you through that day. When we see somebody get saved, or whether we don't see somebody get saved, we need to look back at it and go, you know what, what did God want to show me in that moment? What, did God, what truth did God, God want to show me in that moment? When that, guy, uh, when that gentleman opened the door and said, when I asked him, you know, sir, I, you know, I want to show you how to get to heaven, that you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're going to go to heaven today, and the person said no, and then if I, you know, came up to him and, you know, I, I said, you know what, can I leave you with something to read? And they said no. What did that teach me? Not everybody wants to hear the gospel. You say, well, that's pretty plain and, you know, plain to know. No, because we have this idea and this mindset that if somebody hears the gospel, that they're going to automatically want to hear it. But what happens when they don't even want to hear you talk about it? Not everybody's going to even let you get to that point. What you need to do after a day of ministry is you need to think clearly back upon what God has done in your life. Pray and rest in that. Rest knowing that God has done something amazing in your life that day. You say, well, the person didn't get saved. Remember, you're not the one in charge of getting people saved. You're not in charge of it. Your job is to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what Jesus said. It is their job, at, you know, whoever is receiving it at that moment, whether or not they want to take it or leave it. Because did we not just read that Jesus went out preaching and teaching and telling everybody what to do, and then all of a sudden they were offended by him? If they're offended by what Jesus had said to them, then what makes you think that when you preach the gospel that somebody else is not going to be offended by what you say? Are you better than the Lord? No. We know that, right? Not everybody's going to want to hear what you have to say. But don't get out of the game just because somebody rejected you or rejected God's word. Go back out there, do it again. One of the more difficult things to do is actually, to me, for I know for a lot of people, they say, I can't go knock door to door. That's just a scary thing. And it is because it's a new situation every door you knock. Something new every, every time. And they say, I can never do that. The hardest person to preach to is not knocking door to door. To me, that's easy. The hardest person to preach to is your friends and your family. Think about all those times where, you know, maybe like, you know, you felt in your, you know, you felt like God, you know, saying, you know what, just tell them about me. Just give them the gospel. And all the excuses that began to go through your mind. They won't like me. They'll, they'll shun me at family events. They won't want to talk to me anymore. They'll hate me. They'll kick me out of my house. They'll do all. And what oftentimes is that? That's obviously the devil lying to you at that moment because, you know, the devil knows, like, you know, that you're thinking about sharing the gospel because, you know why? You could probably look at your hands and go, well, their hands are getting sweaty. And you could tell they're getting a little nervous. The hardest thing to do is why? Because they know you. They've grown up with you. They've been around you. They know what you were like. You need to get past that. You say, well, how do you do that? Let's put it like this. Maybe you just need to, you know, pull, uh, you know, um, Pull yourself up by your bootstraps and just go for it. 
say, Pastor, why are you saying it like that? Because you need to do it. I know there's all those kinds of excuses. I've had excuses. I've had reasons why I didn't do it. And all the, I got to go home. I got to go do this. You know, you know, Alicia's asked me to fix this like 50 times, and I haven't done it yet. I mean, all these, now is the day. Yeah, she's asked me like 50 times to, like, to, you know, to fix something. But now, all of a sudden, because the Lord asked me to go out and, and preach the gospel, I'm like, oh, yeah, now I'm going to go do it. How convenient, right? If it's waited for 50 times, it can wait one more day, right? But we don't know how, much, how long we actually have to preach the gospel. So why not do it while we have that chance today, right? Like I said, it's tough, it's difficult, but it's a command from the Lord in Mark 16. Later on, he says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to who? Every creature. It's a command from the Lord. And if you don't want to think about it like that, you know, there's always the way of, if you don't preach the gospel, what changes? Nothing. And that person's destiny does not change. Where they're going doesn't change. You say, well, where is that? That would be hell. This sermon actually was not necessarily about going door to door, but it kind of has turned it into that. The whole sermon actually primarily is for those that have been doing God's work, that have been doing the ministry, to remind them to rest. That they need to rest. And so, I want to end it this way. If, you are, if you, you're fully committed to Jesus and his ministry, and like I said, it's okay to rest. But more importantly, don't forget to pray. Because as Mark 6, I didn't go all the way through the end of it, because as Mark 6 continues... Guess what happens? The ministry does not stop. Just because I read all that part and you're going, oh, well, what about the rest? Let me tell you, the ministry started all over again. It says, it says here at the, end of, at the end of it, it says, and whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they, uh, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, uh, touch if it were, but the border of his garment and as many as uh, touched him were made whole. What does it say? Ministry keeps going no matter if you want to be on the sidelines or you want to be in the game. Ministry is going to continue. God's word is going to continue to be preached. But it's about time that I believe that uh, you know, the Christians need to get off the sidelines and get into the game. So my second you know, thing is right here. The first one is this. If you've been, you know, you're committed to you know, Christ and his ministry, the what, it's okay to take a rest once in a while. It's okay. But if you're not fully committed to Christ, start today. Because here's the thing. You've heard all the stuff about how tiring it is and everything else. But let me tell you this. There's nothing like it. Why do I do it? Why, why? Well, for one thing, I'm a Christian. It's not because I'm a pastor. I would be going door to door whether I was a you know, pastor or not. Why? Because God told me to do it. But here's the thing is, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like going home at the end of the day, thinking about all the things that God has done, the people that God saved, that I've gotten to share the message of the gospel with, that all these things, there's nothing like it. Why? I love it. You grow to learn to love it because you look at it and say, you know what? God used me today to change somebody, to talk to somebody. They may not have gotten saved, but you know what? I can guarantee they're thinking about what you said. And at the end of those days, at the end of those days where you say, you know what, I'm tired, I've been used up, I've been, God's used me greatly. I began to think about this and I said, you know what, what, ver what verse or verses begins to show this feeling, this, this idea, this, this, you know, being used of the Lord? And it's a very famous portion of scripture, and oftentimes, for some odd reason, it's always shared at funerals, but it's never really shared at church. It's Psalm 23. Because if we see a person in here that is resting in what the Lord has done and is doing. Psalm 23 you know, says this, the Lord is my shepherd. Some of you can quote this. I know you can. I've heard some of you do it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. 
He leadeth my, uh, me uh, beside the still waters. He re- what? Restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for, my, uh, for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes, it's, doesn't that sound right there sound like you're doing ministry? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of, uh, of death, I will fear no evil. There are times you're going to share the gospel, and the area you're sharing the gospel is pure evil around there. The, the place where you're going is pure evil. It says, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Does that not sound like somebody that's like, hey, I'm going to go out and do ministry and all these things. And he says, you know what, after I do all of that, after God restores my soul, after God all does these things, he says, you know what, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord. Why? Because he wants to learn more about God's word. That's what that whole thing is saying. He says, you know, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever so I can continue to learn who my Jesus is. We need to realize, as it says, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He wants to change you to be like him so that way you don't have all the problems that you have. Like once again, get away from the noise and the distraction and get into his word so he can uh, restore and lead you because here's the thing, you will face the enemy. Some days it's more, uh, it's more known, other days it's more incognito, but you will face the enemy. You will face an enemy today, whether it's the devil or a friend or somebody that you know, cuts you off in traffic. You will find somebody, there will be somebody out there that is an enemy. But just know this, when you're restored, look at that last verse again, it says, goodness and mercy will follow you when you are learning from the Lord. Goodness and mercy will. Here's another, one last verse, and I end with this. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will do what? Make you work harder? Make sure that you're out of breath or that you're burned out. It says, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall what? Find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that ministry is busy. Oftentimes it is so busy. But Lord, help us, help those in this room this morning that maybe where they're feeling tired and weary, that they would take a rest, that they would rest for you know, rest a while to be restored, on, you know, to be restored because you can restore them. When they, uh, and they would be restored through the reading of your word and praying and seeking you. God, for those that maybe have been sitting on the sidelines for way too long, they say, you know what, i got to get into the game. Lord, help, give, give them a reminder. Give them a reminder, Lord, of what they need to do, of what you, your word has called them to do. For some, it may not be going door to door. For some in here, it may be the fact of you just saying, you know what, you need to talk to your coworker. You need to talk to that family member. You need to talk to that friend. You need to t- talk to that person that you don't get along with about the Lord. And help us to realize that when we do ministry, yes, it will be tiring. Yes, it will get to that point to where we're just spent, but there is no greater feeling, there's no greater excitement or joy than when we get to share the gospel with other people. And to realize that at the end of the day, may we not harden our heart and not perceive the the great things that you've done throughout that day, but to be able to go back to it and say, Lord, you've done so many amazing things today. Thank you for using me. Lord, I thank you for every person that is here this morning. God, I pray that you would bless them uh, today and throughout this week. May you give them an opportunity to preach the gospel to someone. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.
do, real, do realize that tonight we do have, yes, ma'am. 